There is a remarkable organization out there that works in the ocean collecting data for research, education, outreach, and so much more. It's called OSEARCH. And today we're with the founder, Chris Fisher. Chris, welcome to River City Live. And it happens to be Shark Week. And in a little bit, we're gonna talk about why it's important to study sharks, but you do so much more beyond that. So again, welcome to the show. And can you give us an overview of what OSEARCH is all about? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, OSEARCH is an organization we started about 15 years ago. All of the shark scientists were really um, stuck studying the large sharks in the ocean because they are difficult to handle and they don't often have the boats or the expertise to be able to capture them and have safe access and let them go alive. The reason we pivoted into this space to assist the science community because around 2005 or so, some reports were coming out that we were down to 9% of our large sharks. And we didn't have the data to manage them back. We didn't know their full migratory range. We didn't know where they were mating, where they were birthing, where they were gestating, where the nurseries were. And if we lose our large sharks, there will be no fish for our grandchildren to eat because they are the system manager, right? They are the top of the food chain. Things like squid and seals explode and wipe out all the small fish that we need to grow up to eat. And so the science community basically said, look, if we don't have a lot of big sharks, there will be no fish for future generations. And I said, let's, let's manage them back. And, and they said, we don't know how. And so that's when we founded OSEARCH. I think that's the biggest misconception. Like, I'm, I'm not really a shark guy. I'm an abundance guy. I'm a fish sandwich guy. I want to make sure all of our grandkids can eat fish sandwiches and lobster rolls. And the path to abundance in the ocean is through the large sharks because they are the lion. They are the wolf. They are the balance keeper. And if we lose them, the abundance of the ocean plummets. plummets. So that's why we pivoted. Then we got into the space, and, I, and again, I, I'm not a marine biologist. I'm more of a, you know, I, I grew up chasing fish and frogs around the woods of Kentucky, fell in love with the water, grew up in a really entrepreneurial family, and I wanted to try to build an enterprise or solve this problem. And I, and I started to learn that in the science space, the reason why we didn't have the information was because the system was broken. The system didn't work. It, it forced all these scientists into individual silos, competing against one another so they could publish first and get the next grant. And so they weren't collaborating. They weren't working together just to create and learn as much as we could, as fast as we could, so we could manage toward abundance for our kids and bring these sharks back. So we started to kind of to modernize the approach and build big collaborative teams of scientists. So every time we touched one of these sharks, instead of one scientist doing one thing, trying to get ahead of the others, we now have 30 scientists doing 21 research projects on every animal we touch, which radically accelerated the rate of learning. And then we open source it to the public so the whole public can be involved in it because in the end, it's gonna take us all. So OSEARCH is really a, a story about a new way, a new way of ocean research so that we can learn what we've never learned before at a rate that has never been achieved in an effort to make sure we deliver our kids an ocean full of fish. And one of the things that I love about what you do, you know, you talked about educating people, your website, social media, I'm on all of them. It's amazing the data that you have in the images, and it's a very powerful platform because for the average person out there, we get how important, how precious the life cycle is. So it's interesting that you're able to tap onto that because I would imagine raising awareness is a big part of what you do. Yeah, well, we knew when we began to start having success at really exploding knowledge forward with the science, and we knew we are going to solve these life history puzzles of these large animals. That's what they call it. That's the full picture of where they mate, birth, migrate, gestate. It's the life history puzzle. That is the puzzle we're trying to solve. It's a hundred, many hundred-year-old secret we knew that even if we, if we only solved the science puzzle and we didn't shift the tone of the conversation around sharks so that people understood sharks and why they were important, then maybe even if we had the data, we wouldn't have the political will or, or the support of the people to actually really bring these animals back. So when you talk about completely open sourcing the project and pushing content in real time, allowing people to come in through Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, having the shark tracker at osearch.org. Those were all vehicles to allow anyone who wanted to be inside the project to come in on whatever platform they preferred. And that was also new in the science space because you're supposed to do this work in secret so that you get ahead of the other science teams, publish and get the next grant. But we don't have to play that game 
because the funding model and, and the people who support us are not from the grant world. So this kind of different source of funding allowed us to, in essence, Googleize the approach, right? I mean, we're doing the same thing that Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or Google do, give everything away so that you have a big enough community, then people wanna communicate with that community and we can leverage that to create the funding we need to pay for the ship because we give the ship to the scientists, they pay nothing. And, and that's been really powerful. The, the a different funding model has allowed us just to pursue a great grandchildren first disposition where the current model of research can't operate that way because the system doesn't reward that. And Chris, you've been doing this, you stated for many years now, what were some of the key breakthroughs? One of them I just learned is the actual process. You flipped it upside down, so that's great. What about any findings out there with sharks or technology, any new technology you were able to develop along this journey? Well, because we're bringing you know, full-time professional watermen in a ship together with the scientists, right? This wasn't done enough in the past. You got your street smarts, your book smarts, right? You got your practical knowledge, those who know how to operate on the water, and you got your academic knowledge because you can't change the future of the ocean on a fisherman's story. You need a peer review published papers, but the scientists have no boats, no money, and can't catch what they study, right? So the first thing we had to do is bring these two communities together and get everybody on a common vision, which is this ocean first, grandchildren first type disposition. Um, with that crew, the professional watermen who live on the uh, live on the ship and operate the ship and the special lift that's on the ship, we were then suddenly able to bring in these large mature white sharks and other large sharks and lift them out of the water for a few minutes. And then this is the first time that the scientists, the academic community, have safe access to the entire body of the animal to leverage the latest technology to solve this life history puzzle. So it was immediately transformational, right? That you you could only do maybe 5% or 3% of what we do with these sharks if you were hanging over the side of a boat trying to deal with it. People get hurt, the sharks get more stressed out, and you can't leverage modern technology over the side of a boat in the ocean unless you lift it out of the water. And so that was just that process of bringing people together. The practical and the academic was enormously powerful and different in the space. And then when you add the layer of now creative scientists and researchers allowing to reach further than they ever have and get creative on what technology we can use to learn and solve this life history puzzle. So we use multiple tags on each of these sharks. They're the most modern tags available today. The fin mounted spot tag is what everyone follows on the shark tracker. That's what gives us real time location data when the sharks stick their fin out of the water. But some of the other things that we're doing are amazing. Like we're taking the bacteria out of the teeth, tongue and gums of these sharks and we know now what antibiotics hospitals need to have on hand in areas where there might be a shark interaction. We know what bacteria is in their mouth, so we know exactly which antibiotic to use, which is hugely powerful because most really traumatic injuries are caused from infection after the bite, runaway infection, because they don't know what antibiotic to use. And so they try one, it doesn't work. They try another one, it doesn't work. Next thing you know, it's a week later, runaway infection, loss of limb. Um, so other things too, you know, like we're at ultrasound, all these animals, we just got the first resting heartbeat of a white shark in history on this last expedition in Nova Scotia last fall, four large white sharks, heartbeats. We couldn't believe it. The average resting heartbeat of a white shark is eight beats per minute, a massive heart that beats super slow. And, um, you know, that is very interesting when you're trying to understand the physiology of the sharks. We're starting to understand things like the bacterial communities that are in their gut and in their uh, intestines. Incredibly simple bacterial communities, much simpler than ours. And I think that's from hundreds of millions of years of natural selection. They've gotten rid of everything they don't need, right? So what they have is a super simple, super efficient design thing, an animal that has the capacity to endure time. Uh, a lot of blood work we're doing. We're doing a lot of great work also with UNF, Dr. James Gelschleider down there in Jacksonville. He takes the blood samples and tests the hormone levels in the sharks. And he's helping us zero in on exactly where and when the sharks are mating because the hormone levels are up higher in both the males and the females in those locations. He's also helping us understand 
at what size do these white sharks mature? When can they have babies? Which I think he's going to publish some groundbreaking work uh, in the coming months that is going to prove that it's quite different than what we think uh, today, and I don't want to steal his thunder. So um, there's so much going on. Again, there's 31 scientists from 21 institutions doing 20 w uh, projects on each white shark we touch. At this point in time, every animal we touch is the most comprehensively studied white shark in the world, and all of that goes back and works through Jacksonville University, the uh, academic home of OSEARCH, Dr. Quentin White, and uh, Dr. Brian Franks and the team there. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to be proud of in Jacksonville when you look at, you know, the leading white shark program in the world being based there at JU and OSEARCH. You got great collaboration even occurring within town, within science teams, with UNF and JU. Like in the past, right, these teams wouldn't work together. They would be competing. But now we're all working for our grandkids in the future. It's a very exciting time. It really is. And I'm blown away by how much that you are doing and how much you're finding. Because like you said, in the science world, it's hard to have that efficiency, but you were able to create a model, share the data, get people involved. So once again, you are doing some remarkable things. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for spending time with us. If people want to get involved, how can they do that with OSEARCH? Well, there's lots of ways. You know, we have summer camps for kids at Jacksonville University, summer uh, OSEARCH camps and shark camps there. Um, we have lots of ways to communicate with us uh, through social platforms. You can tweet the sharks, tweet the scientists, ask questions. Also, you know, we really fund our program through companies that want to make business and do good and through people who buy things they need anyway. You know, if you need a pair of sunglasses, you can buy the Costa OSEARCH sunglasses and fund the ship while you get a nice pair of sunglasses to use on the water. And now you're a lifelong um, philanthropist, right? Uh, so Coast totally gets it, right? They get it if, if they wanna make sure the ocean's full of fish in the future because that's where their product is used. Yeti Cooler does the same thing. SeaWorld is a huge, huge supporter. They are, they are really the 800 pound gorilla in the ocean science space. They are thought leaders in that space. They are the leader in the rescue space. We use a lot of their expertise from their scientists and research communities to make sure we're maxing out what we learn on the science, on the science side when we handle these animals. So, I mean, I think just when, you, when you're looking to spend your dollars, use them and give them to companies that do good, whether it's OSEARCH or any other thing you're passionate about. And when we do that, if we only give our money to these companies that are making business and doing good, we will harness the power and the capacity of corporate of the corporate world to create the abundant future and make it in their best business interest to do so. And I think most people don't think about that when they're spending their hard earned dollar. Who am I going to give this dollar to? What company? Are they making business and doing good? Are they helping kids? Are they helping medicine? Are they helping the ocean? Give your money to those companies and we will all then take control of moving us toward an abundant future. Chris, that is a great message. Thank you so much for your time, all your information. For you at home, if you wanna learn more, go to the website, osearch.org. Today may be tough and tomorrow may feel uncertain, but there's one thing you can always rely on. This is our home. We're heroes, survivors, hard workers, and we look out for each other. And as we look to the future, 